Human desires can be much likened to a river flowing. All humanity yearns for it. Freedom is nothing more than fiction, a deception. Those with power, those who can choose, think nothing of it. What then of those who cannot choose? What about the meek and frail? Not everyone is granted as many options as you all have, making the best possible choices under duress, living the best life. There are no losers in the world I offer. With a turn of the clock, anyone can be a winner. Tell me, why not resign yourself to the flow, this march of time stilled for eternity? Human desires can be much likened to a river flowing. All humanity yearns for it, the endless now. That is why I'm here, you'll find. My existence alone, it is proof and evidence. Freedom is nothing more than fiction, a deception. Those with power, those who can choose, think nothing of it. What then of those who cannot choose? What about the meek and frail? Not everyone is granted as many options as you all have. Will you share? Give them some of yours? Will you call that charity? Or compassion? Will you show it? Imagining them who are granted it to be thus satisfied? Imagining not a piece of wretchedness to remain? Making the best possible choices under duress. Living the best life. There are no losers in the world I offer. With a turn of the clock, anyone can be a winner, given the time. Young, spirited people, trading lives, aiming for new, ever loftier heights with each new day. That explosive motive power is something we lack. The essence of life. And we are here to express ourselves as an embodiment of life. Hey guys, could I have a moment? Meh? Hmm? Yeah? What's up? There's something that I forgot to tell you. From now on, I want us to avoid combat as much as possible. So, Kevez, Agnes, if either of them decide to put up a fight, don't kill them, okay? At this point in the game, Noah no longer needs to extinguish life force, no longer bound to a colony. One needs to make use of that freedom rather than waste limited energy and time fighting. Everything is intimately connected to everything else, and instead of lamenting your changing fate, you should embrace it, adapt to it, utilize it to create a new vision. Running away is a fairly unintuitive strategy for a commander to employ, let alone Cavessian Agnians who have been brainwashed into fighting on an instinctual level from birth. Most troops would view not directly attacking the enemy as poor form. Do not mistake Noah's decision to run away from opposition as an expression of a weakness or fear. See, context is everything. Think about it. You are only about six people and the entire world is literally opposed to you. They have been ordered to kill you on sight. This is not a skill issue, as it is purely a game of numbers. Our protagonists have limited energy and more importantly, a ticking clock as time is the most precious commodity in Ionios. They don't have time to waste fighting battles when Mio's death looms over them all, reminding them how they are swimming against the river's current. They need to focus on winning the war, not the battles, and the war is won by reaching Sword March. Since the Battle of Attrition plays straight into the hands of Mobius, this shows Noah's foresight.
What Noah said in this little section about how we should actively avoid fighting and simply run to the sword march is something I've never heard a JRPG protagonist say in a very long time. Wow, tough guys, eh? It's a wild ride, this passage of fate. We got ourselves a nice little awakening. You were all talk when you left here, but you've nothing to show for it, D. Oh, spare me, P. After all, I did precisely what I was meant to do. In that case, I believe it's my turn next. H, I'm pretty sure you already had your kicks the other day when you wiped out Colony 8, no? Surely the turn is mine. Honestly, you make more noise than the rabble at a feast. That. Even if you did stop its raging flow, it will soon burst through. All it takes is the slightest fissure. And that is fate. I've told you before, haven't I? D. This is an important part of the game that shows how Mobius views the people of Ionios and their suffering as a drama, as a show of entertainment. This might feel bad for people like us, whom death means something. We all live with the knowledge that our lives won't last forever, yet the same paradigm doesn't hold true for Mobius. Let's remember the infinity symbol that represents the Mobius ideology. They have basically designed a self-sufficient reality, Ionios, that seemingly resides in the eternal now. These beings does not have the fear of death. They live with the assumption that they will exist in perpetuity. It is much easier for such beings to view the suffering of Ionios as a form of entertainment. With humanity that it is no wonder they can't empathize or understand the very concept of suffering. However, as we'll explore more deeply in the following sections, Mobius are not just this being evil for the sake of evil type of villains, even taking into account all of their perversion and black and white depictions, Mobius are representing a primal emotion that resides in all humans, the desire for existence and the fear of non-existence. Funny pattern you got there. You can talk. You've got those shiny chest doodads. We've always had these. You know, I've never even thought of myself as strange before. So many things. Taken for granted. We're pretty different, huh? Worlds apart. No one's worlds apart. If anything, we should be questioning all that we've thought to be true. Differences are all a matter of perspective. What I really enjoyed here is that Mio initially says we're pretty different, worlds apart, in regards to bodily differences Agnes and Kevesi have. This is actually a pretty crude observation. As Yuni says, Mio is taking things at face value, yet the skeptic of the group, Tyon, is questioning that assumption and saying differences are all a matter of perspective. An exposition here isn't needed because in the previous chapter, we learned that these former enemies were actually all pawns in the Mobius' chessboard. Their seeming differences as Kevesi and Agnians are all but a farce. In life, what you focus your attention on shapes your perceptions, values, and worldview. If you focus on the frivolous details like whether Lanza's arm has lines or Senna has this glowing orb in her chest, you will lose the forest from the trees, getting bogged down on the details. No wonder you will see each other as worlds apart, as Mio says. We're pretty different, huh? Worlds apart. On their way to Sword March, when Tyon insists that they take the riskier but faster path, it was really interesting that when Lance asked for Noah on what to do, we are getting a flashback from chapter 1 where Noah is remembering how little time Mio has left, counting the days on her diary. When it was time to decide, you would think, you would assume that he would agree with Tyon, right? 
Time is of the essence, after all. Surely Noah will be on board. To my surprise, Noah decides to take the safer but longer path, even after considering how little time Mio has. This is another interesting decision that sets apart Noah from the others. He doesn't take uncalculated risks. There is no guarantee knowing the strength of opposition on the riskier path, the path that Tyon is suggesting. If they die along the way, then all of this will be pointless. If they get stuck there, they can waste even more time tracking back to where they are now. And Noah says that even while knowing the heat is going to be unbearable for Mio on the longer path, he has faith in Mio that although she doesn't like heat, the party's long-term safety is more important than even Mio's short-term discomfort. As a commander, Noah is making some key decisions along the way, and he's doing a pretty good job so far. Let's continue. I think I'd rather take the safe route. As for the heat, we can probably figure something out. There, four against two. <sighs> Tyon, Senna. Please. <sighs> Fine then, if you absolutely insist. This section will focus on a very important world building event. And I'll point to something that not a lot of people realize. The Annihilation event's portrayal and its actual significance. This is a very complex topic we'll delve into later, but it's time to lay the foundation here. See, in Ionios, these random explosions are happening like a glitch in the software or a bug in a video game. This is scientifically called the antimatter collision. When matter and antimatter, which are made up of directly opposite charges, collide, they produce high levels of energy, which results in an explosion. Keves and Agnes are respectively from the worlds of Xenoblade 1 and 2, and we learn that these worlds are like plus and minus, matter and antimatter. In Xenoblade 2, after Klaus's experiment, the Earth was split into two universes, Bionis and Ulrust. And due to their opposite charges, as Nia says, they yearn for each other, they attract each other, to become one again, and before being one again, they will destroy each other. This is a striking similarity to the law of regression from Elden Ring, how all things yearn eternally to converge. Director, the Beanstalk cannot hold. The Saviorite Rebels are very close to capturing it. We have no choice. Initialize Ail. Prepare the conduit. Roger. The conduit's authorization has failed. How come? We're locked out by Professor Klaus. We can't secure access from our side. What did you say? Trinity processes syncrate at 96%. Dangerous. Ridiculous. It's perfectly safe. We are about to bear witness to the birth of a universe. Once, only a god could perform such a miracle. But today, mankind moves one step closer to the divine. Are you serious? Do you even fully understand that thing? What's the alternative? Do you want to just surrender this place to them? The conduit is a gift from some divine entity. It is a gateway. A gateway that will take us to an entirely new world. You're delusional. Divine entity? The conduit is nothing more than a meta-universe manifold. Galea, we humans are fools. 
We've ravaged the planet. We are on the verge of burning even the skies above. But the conduit could transform us into something so much more. <laughs> A map from the survey branch. Annihilation events occur frequently here. Annihilation events? You mean... Look. It happens here too. And what is interesting is that after this fairly serious subject brought up by Tyon and how they need to make sure they keep these explosions in mind, Noah does this. It's my duty to be. Thank you. Uh, sure. Now this following section is my favorite part of chapter 2. We need to discuss this criminally underrated flashback. It all starts with Mio asking what the deal is with Noah's sword. Then we go back to Noah's childhood, to a point where the party is training for combat, and Garvel picks a fight with Noah and attacks him. This results in Noah's physical weapon breaking. Keep this in mind for the next section where Noah gives the broken sword to Riku and this very interesting conversation takes place. Well, anything else? You... Nothing weakling! <laughs> Blast it all! Ugh. Oh, you... Get it now! Especially this part where after Riku demonstrates how strong of a weapon Lucky Seven is, I want you to pay attention to how sad Noah becomes from his face and how he opens up about the reason why he hesitates in fighting and feels so scared of what they become on the path Ionios is urging them to take. How life is not and should not be about survival of the fittest. How life is so much more than just fighting. There's not even a nick in it. Friends surprised? Indeed, it's most prized of swords. Even armor of Faronis gets sliced to itsy bits. I think I'll pass. Pass? So you not have need for? Yeah, it's too strong. Hmm. Noah want Lance and friends to kick buckets? No, what the spark? Same as letting friends die. No, it's not. If friends not fight, cannot survive. Sure, but I don't need to use your sword. Then, why Noah not call Blade? It's not our choice, I just can't. False. Riku see through like transparent. <sighs> Noah can call Blade. Just no big desire of fighting spirit. Riku? Hey, is he serious? <sighs> Noah? What the? All this time? Huh? <sighs> if death is not option, should live. Only way is fight like life depends. Thinking of self alone is way of coward. Though, Riku no feeling well. I'm afraid. Of fighting, you mean? Of this world. It's so brutal and relentless. And I'm afraid of what we might... become. Mate! Ho oh, ho ho! Riku knew Noah was hero material. Huh? It true this sword possess incredible power. Might even rob enemies of many much lives, yes. But only those who understand nature of terror have right to wield. 
Quoth Master Pun of Riku, anyhaps. Before we go further, I want to discuss with you something that happens later into the game and explore some of the themes of this particular Ascension quest. I feel like Chapter 2, a fairly contemplative and chill section of our adventure, fits this Ascension quest really well. When we're back at the castle, a lost number soldier informs Gondor that one giant monster chased off their entire squad in an exhibition and how this monster let them go and didn't kill them. So to find out more, we go to find this monster who ambushed the squad, kill them, and then learn that these were the small fry. How the ginormous turkin completely wrecked them up above. And after we run after him, I want you to pay very close attention to the first thing the giant turkin says, and how it is an ironic reference to the exact sentiments Noah had at the beginning of chapter 2. How just because you're skilled and appear to be strong, doesn't mean that you will take the initiative. There is time and place for everything. Especially I want you to pay attention to this moment, and how similar this is to Noah's hesitation of fighting, and how violence only brings more strife and suffering for both parties. Why were you running? Because you were chasing. <laughs> Anybody run away when scary. But you're a ginormous turkey. When she puts it like that. It's definitely more ginormous than a normal turkey. What is big idea? <laughs> Barging into roost with muddy foots, it shows poor breeding. Don't act innocent, beak freak. You're the one who messed up my guys. Huh? And what problem with that? You want to know the problem? How about I explain it to you with my fists, you shit-crusted feather brain? I not know where humans came from, but they attacked me, so I chased them away. That's the end of story. A lot of ruckus in neighbour brood recent. Talking just want peace and quiet. Quiet! Is that too much to ask? Well, we did hear it at the soldiers get away. Hmm. <laughs> you humans think we special. Keep coming to capture and attack us. When Turkins get attacked, we return crawl for crawl. But we never attack humans if humans not attack us. What? So you weigh up whether or not you want to pick a fight? Humans not any different. Ah. Violence only breed more violence. Therefore, when hit tokens, expect it back. Did you just threaten me? Wow, you got guts, blockhead. I think I'll grill him for supper. Hold on, let's not get heated, Gondor. It does make a lot of sense what he's saying. So, tell us, why are you here? They're no big mystery. Had Argu over territory, so now Turkins just look for easy living place. Somewhere comfy? Comfy, yes. Yeah. Turkins is an island, just like Hermans. Not an island? What, you gonna build some kind of bird confederacy and then attack us? No confederates. I'm not attacking block like you. When fighting, I alone. So, what do you mean, you're not an island? It has kids. These are my turklets. I search for easy living place for them. Ah. Huh? Uh, oh. That's why, when strangers attack, I has to fight back. Humans only flock with birds of same feather. I try talk sometime, but they only run away. Can't really speak for you personally, bud, but it sounds like you've had it rough. Very rough. Like trouble with neighbours wasn't bad enough. They're also little food to eat. After we complete the shopping list for the little Turkins to migrate as a family, something unexpected happens. What wrong with you humans? 
this my mess? Shut up! If we don't take you out, we'll never be able to look our commander in the face. You the ones that attack us! <laughs> don't let the monster confuse you. You dipshit! What are you playing at? And after these guys were attacking the Turkin for no reason other than their self-image, we realized something that genuinely made me tear up in my playthrough. Not only the Turkin here wanted to just protect his children, something that everyone can relate to, but also went out of his way to not get into fights. As the soldier said, the monster let them go in order to not risk this exact tragic outcome that we'll witness right now. An outcome that really hit hard and made me realize how precious one's life is, not just for the sake of yourself, but also for your loved ones, for people who rely on you, how you tragically affect their lives by your death. Hi! You still with us? Ah. Uh, thank much for help. What the hell? You could have taken them all out easy! Things was tricky. Turkin truce. No parent can bear to put own Turklets in danger. Yeah. I get it. Are all the Turkins all right? Turklets are safe, but I not so. Please, no. Don't tell me. <sighs> My gizzard. It leaking out. <sighs> Pull yourself together! I'm not letting you leave your bloody kids alone! Gondor... That is correct. I also not think it come to this. Tragic day indeed. Raising little turklets can be such... really hard, hard work. But this... what happened here... this is own fault. Exactly like you say. Brought this all on top of self. Every time get attacked, I was such big flock fool to keep fight back. Never should fight human in first place. Quiet better. Should have run away to save a roost. Think about your children, damn you! If you die now. Maybe they can survive on own, my turklets. It no like their feather brains. <gasps> so you there, small as human, please hear my lastest request. What is it? Let's hear it. If there's... If there is place that's safe and have no fighting, I want you to take my... Turklets there so safe and tight. If they just need live, then Turklets can handle by self. But they... They not do good for fighting. They not strong. Like I was when in primes of use. If... If Turkin can ask you... He's gone. Yeah. I don't care if it's a turkin. Seeing someone die before your eyes and not being able to do anything about it, it's... It's shit. But I think we did all we could. <sighs> yeah, I guess. Now coming back to the main game, this is the moment where the rest of our party gains the ability to become Ouroboros. And with the black fog that is slowly eating away at this reality of Ionios, Mobius is starting to truly feel the pressure. And 
to where this was taken. I think Yorin did the right thing. We can go through here, and then we're out. You must flee for the colony. Mom! Dim away! This is the moment that is dynamically speaking providing the backbone for the reality Mobius has created for its inhabitants. This Mobius here is living off from the life energy of those in Ionios, as we've previously alluded to in the first episode as the pawns of a chessboard. This is a great way to show how humanity's suffering is to Mobius's benefit, yet what the purpose of this dynamic is for will be evident later on. anymore they're his fuel huh? even so after the mobius's defeat it's very important to note what remains a sad shell of a man but not just a man this is a man who has rejected his humanity in exchange for eternity in ionios just to get out of this samsaric cycle of life death and suffering he decided to inflict suffering towards humanity to attain immortality himself and absolute survival. However, even Ionios is not completely immune from the effects of entropy, as evident by the black fog. This is the moment where we see when someone who's filled with so much hostility and anger dies, they cannot accept their death. obsessively cling to life to validate their existence, becoming a 12-year-old child, giving a temper tantrum. Noah as an offseer hears his final thoughts and emotions before his departure from this world and decides to give him a proper death. Even if Mobius is the reason why the world is the way it is now, this pathetic shell of a man used to be a human like all of them. And Noah decided to honor that memory regardless, as this very urge is undeniably similar to all of their desires to continue living and existing. The aspect of humanity that brings together Mobius and Ouroboros in an ironic way. And I want you all to listen to this flute section because it is so emotional and powerful. So this is the console. This is how he really looks. He's fading, just like during a homecoming. No way. You're not sending him on. You realize how messed up that is? Huh? You think so? How do you not? Think about the things this guy did. 
he tried to kill us all and rob the soldiers of their remaining life. You're right. Both of you are right. And Mio? Honestly, I'm not sure I would. Okay. Oh, I'll just do it anyway. Just now, I felt his essence brush past me. It felt just the same as ours. So, I feel I have to do this, you know? <sighs> Mio, have you ever touched a mote of light from a Kavesi? <sighs> They're the same as ours. On the other side, the people live hoping the same things as us. Sometimes, he's just too kind. That or he just loves his job. He too by the book. An airhead. That's what he is. Don't think he's thinking about it too deeply. Just doing it because it's part of his nature, eh? Hmm. Weirdo. I concur. Mimi. Finally, with this, the stage is set for Chapter 3, the most underrated section of Xenoblade 3 that I can't wait to analyze. Until then, don't forget to subscribe to the channel to be notified, and as always, thanks for watching. I still can't stop shaking. Because of the flame clock? Yeah, I was terrified.